Good afternoon, everyone. Today we will continue with uh, another session uh, of this uh, webinar series, uh, Making Industry 4.0 Working for All. Uh, I am I'm delighted uh, to continue with, with a more in-depth uh, view of, of the different technologies uh, that uh, the four industrial revolution are bringing to us, and uh, particularly uh, how they are uh, impacting on, on our SMEs and, and, and on the economies, etc., in the countries uh, where uh, we want to support. Yeah. Uh, my name is Alejandro Rivera. I am the executive officer at the Directorate of uh, Digitalization, Technology and Agribusiness uh, from UNIDO, and uh, I will be moderating this session today. I will share my screen to you to introduce uh, the session. So uh, the name of the, of the session is uh, that we will start today yeah? is uh, Digital Transformation from Above. So we will be having a look in, uh, from the role of drones in agriculture and forestry. For this occasion, uh, we have uh, invited uh, our distinguished uh, panelist, Mr. Alex Waxon, which is uh, the CEO of Open Forest. Uh, Mr. Alex Waxon is, is uh, 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 founded, uh, founder of uh, Open Forest Company in, in 2011. Uh, Open Forest uses uh, the knowledge in uh, geographical information systems, uh, mapping, natural resource management, uh, landscape, uh, I mean, to support sustainable landscape projects, uh, software development, such as agroforestry, forest restoration, forest conservation, among many other uh, applications. Uh, the goal for this company is to develop uh, the entire information chain uh, from the field towards all stakeholders and public. Yeah, uh, we will be also having uh, Mr. Maximilian uh, Mirstic, uh, co-founder of uh, Daria. Uh, since uh, 2018, Mr. Mister. Uh, Mr. Mystic is uh, uh, a drone expert and, and the CEO of uh, Daria uh, uh, company. He focuses uh, mainly on the challenging aspects of drone business, such as data acquisition and uh, artificial intelligence based learning, and, as well as indoor navigation without GPS signal. Yeah? Mr. Mystic is also a member of multiple international uh, drone networks where he has been able to build a strong relationships uh, to drone solution providers worldwide. We will be having also with us our colleague, uh, Mr. Stavros uh, Papas Tavru, yeah? uh, who is Industrial Development Officer in the Agro Industries and Skill Development Division from UNIDO. Uh, Stavros is involved uh, with the management of in, in technical education projects with a focus on agriculture, forestry, light uh, manufacturing, and water resource management. Yeah? Uh, he presently oversees technical education projects uh, covering eight countries in the MENA region and in South Saharan Africa. Yeah? And the last but not least is uh, my colleague also Farruk Alinjano, uh, who is Industrial Development Officer in the Innovation and Digitalization uh, Division. Uh, Farouk has uh, nearly 25 years of experience in international organizations as well as the private and public sector, uh, among others. He is responsible for formulation and uh, implementation of the UNIDO technical cooperation projects focusing on industrial design, branding, modernization, enterprise competitiveness, and digital transformation in, in uh, several regions uh, from Africa, Europe, Central Asia, Latin America, among others. So for this session, yeah, uh, we will be uh, talking about uh, particularly on, uh, we will referring to unmanned aerial vehicles, yeah, uh, commonly uh, known as drones. I think uh, most of us have seen uh, the applications of drones uh, in, in, uh, for pleasure, for, for the military industry, but uh, I think few of us have seen uh, them on action, uh, particularly on, on agro-industry, uh, value chains, and, and with uh, productive purposes. 
Yeah. So today uh, we will be, uh, I mean, uh, having a view how they are more uh, relevant for the agriculture, uh, how they can uh, be uh, more useful in collection of special data to carry out more accurate yield production projections, uh, improve production and identify crop disease, pests and weeds, and also how they can uh, be impacting on, on the optimization of, of these uh, chemicals, etc., uh, compacting the soil, etc., and the combination of, of this data, yeah, uh, can help us, uh, can help uh, farmers and, and different uh, stakeholders in, in the value chain uh, to improve uh, the sustainability and, and to ma the manage of, of uh, natural resources. Well, for this webinar, uh, uh, we will examine uh, the potential and limitation of, of this uh, type of technologies in agriculture and forestry, particularly in the context of developing countries. Uh, our external invited uh, panelists and our colleague Stavros uh, will provide further insights on, on the potential and opportunities of the application of these technologies, while our colleague uh, Farouk will introduce a UNIDO concrete uh, project that is, is ongoing uh, using this type of technologies. So we will be having a, an initial round of presentations from the panelists. And later on, uh, we will start with a round of questions to each of the panelists. Uh, for all our attendees of these uh, webinars, uh, we would like to encourage you to put uh, your questions in writing, if possible, uh, using the uh, chat uh, function. And uh, also for your information, today uh, we will be recording this session and we will make it available afterwards in our Knowledge Group uh, DTA uh, platform. And we will also put there the presentations of the panelists. Having said that, I would like uh, to give the floor to uh, uh, Mr. Alex Waxon. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for this introduction. So I'm going to share my screen now. Today, I'm providing an initial overview about satellite drone applications and how to make them accessible via interactive web maps. I'm sharing some of our almost 10 years experience working with remote sensing data and applications in the developing countries around the world. Just a few words. Um, Open Forest is a mission-driven social enterprise. Today, we are about 12 persons working in our team. We're working as consultant, but also establishing forest information management platforms and mapping platforms such as explore.land. And we're working with clients like governmental agencies, NGOs, and agro and forestry um, companies worldwide. So the initial question basically is, why do we need data? For example, remote sensing data from drones and satellite. So the answer is quite simple. Better information contributes to better management decisions. And um, the data is needed for various purposes. So just to, to outline a few like sustainable land management. So it's very valuable for planning, for inventory, but also for certification and damage assessment, but also to get topographic maps to lay out the planning for agricultural ventures, um, including wildlife monitoring, soil erosion, but also for detecting illegal activities, which sometimes also um, yeah, occur, like illegal harvesting, logging, or encroachment, or verifying boundaries um, of projects. So the sky is the limit with the data. So for someone who's not working on a day, daily basis re with remote sensing data, the big number of data sources, their specifications, the multitude of potential analysis um, can be quite challenging and overwhelming. So I prepared these guiding questions to help to specify the information requirements and condense the potential available data sources. So because without having these questions clear, so really answered, there's no need to think about drone or satellite image applications at all. So basically, we have to understand what do we want to observe? So what's the spatial size? Um, what's the um, 
uh, minimum required time re uh, resolution and of course also what is our budget because with a lot of money you can get a lot of precise information but um, you have to really find a sweet spot um, that works for your project in order to make the best possible decision. So what do we want to observe? For example, um, satellites like Sentinel and Landsat can capture with one single shot, which is called a seam, several thousands of hectares just in a second. And every week they are able to cover the entire world with a resolution of 10 to 30 meters per pixel image resolution. So in comparison, so I have shown this picture, um, a civil drone, um, like a fixed wing drone, um, in the lower to medium price segment, so a civil drone, um, might only capture 1,000 to 3,000 hectares maximum per day. So, however, as an astonishing high resolution in comparison to satellite imagery, so of 5 to 20 centimeters per pixel. And the big advantage, especially um, in the tropics, is that um, you, are, you receive um, pictures um, w without any clouds, where you often have problems with satellite imagery. So this is a great advantage. I try to just outline a few pro and cons because um, drones always have to seem in the context of remote sensing as one tool. So and I try to um, compare them a little bit. So drones are more for local um, image capturing, satellite have more of a global approach. The time resolution for drones is you can have them on demand. With satellite, you have them regularly. Um, spatial resolution is extreme high with drones, which has some advantages, but also some disadvantages. Satellite imagery in comparison is relatively low. Yeah, so basically essential is that um, drones have a lower coverage, high resolution, but also higher costs in comparison um, to satellite imagery. Today, we're going to have a little more focus on the drones. So drones used in the context of agriculture, forestry and resource management are really lightweighted um, autonomous airborne platforms, which can collect data um, along predefined flight trajectories. So you can really plan them and they will fly um, autonomous. Um, and for this purpose, drones can be equipped or carry different optical or thermal sensors. And for, for today, I just want to differentiate between fixed wing drones, which are used to map larger areas, um, and copter drones, which don't have the, the, the same range, but can potentially mount bigger sensors and can be used for very precision positioning of sensors. Um, so that's so. So to not just um, give you um, words, I want to show you maybe one and a half minutes um, some impressions of drones in use. So what you see here is a fixed wing a drone at start and also later during landing. So they are very handy today, easy to use, um, and you can basically carry them as you did maybe, uh, let's say, a few years ago, your GPS device to the field. And if something unexpected has to be checked, so you can just throw them in the air and they can capture along um, a, yeah, a, a mapped area all the things you, you need to see. So they come back and then you can just take out the camera and read in the photos in order to um, further process um, the data. So they come in different formats. What you see now is an open source drone, which is very performative while um, having very low cost. This is very important for the um, developing context because you can repair them yourself. And here you see um, a multi-rotor copter. This is uh, a drone which can fly very precisely and mount yeah, sometimes a few kilograms of very um, sophisticated sensors today even lighter, like um, um, laser sensors. Yeah, so this was just a, um, a short impression. I hope you could see the video. They will share it also as a, as a YouTube link in, in the chat. Um, well, when working in agriculture, forestry or landscape um, resource management, um, 
the data management process has usually these three steps. So there's a data acquisition step where the data is obtained. There's a data processing and analysis process uh, step. And then the, the third step is the information management. So the information management is the place where the data sit, where it's, where it's made accessible and shared within the project or also with the, with the public or other stakeholders. In this overview, I've compiled the various data acquisition methods just to give a, a brief overview. So there you, we have the possibility to obtain data via satellite, like optical or radar. Many of them are open source and free available like Sentinel and Landsat. Um, you can obtain data with drones um, to create um, different um, data sets like auto photo um, maps or um, 3D elevation models but you can also um, um, collect data with, with a mobile field device. After um, acquiring these data sets, they need to be processed in order to create um, different um, remote sensing products, we call them. So that could be a growth model, a land cover classification, an automated tree detection um, algorithm that runs all the pictures to derive specific information out from the data. And I want to just highlight um, a few, starting with set, um, um, satellite imagery. Um, I have decided to show you one example of an NDVI. So NDVI is a normalized difference, difference vegetation index. It is used to identify vegetation and to provide um, a measure of its health and vitality. So this is a very important index for spe specifically um, for agricultural area. So I ask, want to ask you to have a, um, a close attention to the area of interest and at the, at the bottom part, which is, has this um, red um, polygon. So if I'm switching um, between um, February and January, you see a change there. So this is considered a drop in, in this photosynthetic ac um, activity and this is detected with the NDVI index. Such a drop can be a lack of nutrients, droughts, pest disease, storm, floods, harvesting events, whatever. And they um, provide an early information, let's say for the manager to see if something's going into an, an, a wrong direction and maybe need to be um, changed or adapted. I quickly run you through some other examples. Um, we can have land cover analysis uh, was based on satellite imagery to see how is the landscape structured, where's forest, where's shrubland, farmland, and so on. Um, we can have a change detection on, on landscape level with satellite imagery to see how forest cover is changing, how, how land is converted towards different purposes and land use. We can use um, radar imagery uh, derived um, elevation models to do large scale landscape planning um, based on the on the slope, for example. Yeah, so these are just some, a few examples what you can do with satellite imagery. I'm now moving over to the drone maps, which can basically do very similar things, but at a much higher resolution. For example, it's also land. This is a land use classification um, based on drone imagery. We can have a change detection so we can see at, um, already single trees which have been um, removed from a forest to see, um, for example, reduced impact logging methods. Um, we can um, create growth models to see how crops or trees are developing over time. And um, we could have even tree detection. So coming slowly to an end, um, all this information sits in an information system, which can access with a geographic information system, such as QGIS or interactive web maps. I want to show you the last example, which is a web map that has a satellite map in the background with a low resolution. And this is a way of how to, you can share your, your data with, with the public and stakeholders. This area has been um, reforested um, in 2016, a drone map has been created. And one year later, you can 
basically see the forest um, growing back. So this is a very impressive way on how to um, present and share this uh, remote sensing data from drones and satellite. And to make these tools accessible, we have um, set up a platform called explore.land where everyone can basically yeah, share their remote sensing data with their stakeholders, community, the public, and supporters. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alex, uh, for this uh, fascinating and, and colorful uh, 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 presentation, yeah? and particularly for bringing us uh, into the world of, of, of satellite and drone imagery. Yeah, um, and particularly, uh, I like uh, to highlight uh, uh, the message you are giving us on the relevance of data, yeah, which is a critical asset in, in most of the four IR uh, technologies and, and the management process that it, it needs uh, to be followed, uh, the potentials and limitations, and also for bringing us in, on into the different uh, type of, of drones that can be used and applications. Thank you very much. Uh, I will continue with the uh, second panelist, Ms. Maximilian, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, same here, I'm going to share my presentation with you. Thanks to the organizers for the opportunity of talking to you today. Um, digital transformation, <coughs> the role of drones in agriculture and forestry. Um, the company Dahlia um, is a Viennese-based startup company dealing with drone technology and uh, what Alex perfectly stressed out in his presentations, how far this technology can bring us, what, what are the purposes behind. Our scope is much, not so much different, but I would like to take you on a little journey in eight minutes. Um, um, what are the challenges um, and, and what are the benefits um, that especially can be, be taken for agriculture and forestry in drone usage. I was talking about the journey. My journey begins sometime in 2010 uh, when drones um, entered the commercial market when the first industrialization took place. And in the very beginning of this technology, flight operations was the major item to cover. How to have an easy handling drone with a stable flight operation was very much the focus of all drone manufacturers and drone service providers. Uh, and the data capturing, something that Alex uh, now perfectly stressed out, uh, was not so much in focus yet because first of all, we had to make sure that these things are not falling from the sky like dead birds. Um, over the time, um, in the last 10 years now, it was then the shift that flight operations became more and more professionalized more and more stable, easy to use. You didn't have to have a perfectly experienced uh, um, operator anymore. And data, data capturing more or less took over uh, uh, more and more importance and, and focus in technical development. Now in 2020, I'd like to say we have perfectly robust autonomously flying drones um, in the outdoor sector, as long as there's a GPS signal Many, many drones, and let it be fixed wings or multi-copters, are capable of flying um, operations with obstacle detections in a very safe uh, and smooth way. Uh, so what our company, Dari, is doing, we, as we've been founded in 2018, we jumped on the data capturing end um, and, and focused also on indoor operations of drones, which is something new that I'd like to stress with you in the next couple of minutes. So um, our initiation was the Industry 4.0 um, hype. I would call it hype now that it's, it's coming to a more smoother, more uh, um, industrialized and, 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 and organized discussion. Uh, we're moving drones from data black boxes that are capable of recording pictures, uh, taking pictures, recording videos into a fully integrated uh, data processing unit uh, which is not only capable of flying outdoor in agriculture and, and forestry, but also having its positive impacts on indoor operations, let this be warehouses, let this be production facilities, where especially in, in, in Western Europe and the United States, um, drones are used for increasing the grade or the level of efficiency in so many processes, especially non-value-added processes, where there are big opportunities 
to collect data, to interpret data, and also to, to uh, put a word on Alex there, uh, a perfect line there. Um, make good management decisions require good data uh, as their basis. So again, um, Daria um, uh, jumped on this industry 4.0 strategy. Uh, we make it fly. So our drones are uh, in, 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 in many business fields and many industries. Just a couple of, of items um, to cover. It's all about data acquisition. It's all about object detection, object recognition, something that Alex also pointed out in terms of identifying trees, um, identifying um, um, soil, uh, identifying level of harvest or harvesting potential, uh, and so on. So this is what is part of our mission and our strategy, and this is what we're having for. Therefore, we're using advanced technology, as I've stated in the beginning, uh, the drone industry is giving us a very good playground here of, of robust technology that is um, easy to, to use, easy to adapt, so we can fully focus on the, table, the, the topics of data acquisition and artificial intelligence. So we see the drone as a sensor carrier and the sensors applied to the drone are our suppliers of data, data that can be um, processed on the drone or off the drone once the drone has been landed, the data has been taken in multiple ways and multiple aspects in order to provide uh, good information capable of making the right decisions. Uh, what you see in the picture to the right is one of our uh, um, uh, prototypes that might not be the first in line when we're talking about agriculture and forestry because it's indoor. But what we're doing here is uh, inventory, stock taking. So the drone is capable of flying indoors without GPS signal and doing what usually man, uh, manual work has to do, counting things, checking, searching, all these uh, um, kind of procedures which are not value added that can easily be, be done by drones with more high accuracy. Our contribution to uh, agriculture and forestry is a project that we actually did in 2017 with a partner, um, Birdview, in, in um, Brazil. Um, the customer at that moment was Citro Suco, which is a provider of um, uh, um, orange, orange harvesting, uh, where their interest was very much in predictability of harvest. So their question was, um, in how far can drones and, and data collected by drones help me as a, a, a orange provider um, give a good forecast and estimation on the quota of harvest within the next season. The world market of uh, harvested crops uh, is very much depending on uh, the quotas and, and, and the, the potential output of, of certain uh, regions in, in certain times of the year. And the better this forecast can be done, the better the pricing inside the market can be carried out. So this was a very uh, uh, decisive item for managers to decide uh, and to position their harvest on the world market in a very early stage because they were capable of deciding or, or predicting what the harvest will bring. Not only that, because this is a very, very uh, economic focused uh, um, subject matter, it was all about um, bringing out pesticide, detecting in a very early phase where we expect trees uh, um, not to, to carry enough harvest, uh, to see where, where any uh, um, um, bugs uh, or else would have an influence on, on the harvest. So the data collected by the drones was not only there to predict the harvest, but also to safeguard that preventive measures for any deviation in the expected behavior can be um, applied in a very early phase. So this was a project we did two years ago, uh, was a very successful one uh, together with a partner. Our role in that subject matter was um, taking the data collected by the company Birdview, um, and, and uh, applying um, artificial intelligence uh, and um, providing the data backwards. Meanwhile, Birdview, high recommendation, they have their own drone biocontrol um, that, that is contributing to these services. 
in a nutshell, there are a couple of items uh, that got to be outlined. Drones, since they made a good uh, um, evolution throughout the last years, still have some feel of exotic, complicated, um, regulatory-wise. It's, it's, it's not an easy one to start your drone everywhere. We feel that there's a lot of work going on uh, to, to make sure that drones will be applied as standard tools, just like forklifts or, or many other tools in, the, in, in various industry sectors. We expect that to take place no later than 2025. Um, that all of these aspects about drones um, that, that can be taken on, on the balance scorecard will apply and that we will see a big leap forward or big giant step forward um, drone technology. There is rule making uh, and, and, and law giving discussion. Uh, we've achieved the JAROS, which is something that each and every drone provider should have an eye on. This is an internationally uh, um, um, relevant uh, frame set of, of uh, um, requirements that gotta be followed and which is here on the right side um, to come to an end is some kind of discussion we're leading here in, in Europe at the moment um, drone operations indoors where there's no legal frame set yet but we're working on it to get this done that there will be permissions for flying in a very early stage so I'm looking forward to your questions. Uh, thanks for your time, thanks for your attention, and see you later. Thank you very much, uh, Maximilian, for this uh, very nice presentation, and, and particularly for highlighting uh, the importance of, of data acquisition uh, and, and the challenges associated to regulation, I mean, to the regulatory framework and the standards that are needed also if we want to uh, have a broader application of, of these drones, yeah? uh, particularly how is, is their linkage with other uh, 4IR technologies like artificial intelligence and, and, and so on. And um, particularly, I think it's, it's very valuable the example you uh, present on the orange uh, production in Brazil. Uh, I will continue now with uh, Stavros. Yeah, the floor is yours, Stavros. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Let me just quick share my screen and then, okay, I hope uh, everyone can, can see my screen. Yes, please go ahead. So I'll start. Thank you uh, very much for giving me this opportunity to talk about this topic. It's uh, something that I'm quite uh, interested in and it was very, very nice to hear from the two previous speakers, their perspectives and forestry and examples. And just want to summarize and say some key words from the previous uh, presenters saying, we're talking about data, we're talking about information, we're talking about decisions. And then with our final uh, speaker was the mention of costs and all these things that tie together to help make better decisions and gain efficiencies is, is really where I'm going to go with starting my presentation and introducing the topic of precision agriculture where drones have come in now as another tool to this topic. So I'll start with uh, this next slide. Um, in our training uh, pre preparation session, uh, colleague of mine said, uh, this looks like a lot of bread. And uh, so when we look at this slide, it's, it's, uh, it's, it is it's on farm, they're harvesting grain, and probably this ends up on somebody's table in the terms of a food product. But there's so much more to this photo that is, let's say, beyond the eye. And, and that comes to, to technology and, and uh, precision agriculture. So when we say about precision agriculture, what is it? It's uh, it's the use of information technology to enhance agricultural production. Farmers in the past managed their farms closely using hand labor and animals to tailor their approaches to farming small patches. As machines replaced this small scale labor, farmers could accomplish more in less time. So fields and farms grew in size. Today's type of precision agriculture began in the 90s with the use of GPS technology to automate tasks in farming, such as grid and grid zone soil sampling and the use of yield monitors and on combines. These methods help farmers track things on a field by field basis or a subfield basis, reintroducing the management specificity loss to large scale mechanization. Precision farming permeates every aspect of crop production, including soil preparation, nutrient and pest management, harvest and storage. In the future, these processes may be so universal 
that what we now call precision agriculture will be simply called agriculture. So going back to the farm sizes and, and the explosion of farm sizes because of, of mechanization, we start to see that farm sizes are huge. And, and when we talk about precision, so the, the small holder, the small farmer who was able to do things by hand, they had a better feel of what was happening on their farms. They had better information, they could assess the health of their crop and make decisions uh, better. So mechanization comes along, changes that and makes it more difficult for farmers to understand what's going on in their fields because it's such a large scale. If we use the example of a farm in Argentina, the average size farm in Argentina is 500 plus hectares. So if we put that into context, that's approximately 900 football fields. So you can imagine how does a farmer able to assess the health or understand what's going on on their farm when they're so big. So back to that photo I showed and saying, okay, there's a lot of technology in that initial photo. And, and, and what, do we, what do we see there? We see GPS technology, we see yield monitors, we see auto steering on the, on the, on the combines and tractors to keep uh, equipment moving uh, online and in grids. Uh, also things, topics as known as controlled traffic farming so that the tractors move specifically on tracks that they don't that they don't overlap so that they're not compacting the soil too much so all this technology is meant to gain efficiencies it's a big investment and farmers have been investing in collecting data for a very long time and their goal is to increase their efficiencies and hopefully that increases the profitability of their farm so reducing error understanding of what's going on better on their fields so this takes us to, okay, now where does drones come into play in, in this new, let's say, in, as new technologies in enhancing precision agriculture? And, and there's many, and I will, I will get into that. Um, the next one, of course, as I mentioned, because of scale of farms growing, that this uh, concept of field scouting and, and uh, the traditional way as farmer would walk the field and assess the health and sample you know, go from, from field to field and understand what's going on. And I think this is where drones have come in or the drone technology with its limitations. And I think our panelists brought that up in terms of range, uh, in terms of uh, maybe complexity, in terms of, uh, you know, comparing cost between satellite imagery and, 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 and using drones. So it's not without, let's say, it's, it's, it's different obstacles, but it has a, uh, given that capability for farmers to be able to understand and assess, assess the health of their crops. So drones come into play and they can be used for a wide range of, of topics. And, and one that I will zero in on here is uh, on weed infestation. So this is uh, something that farmers have to deal with throughout uh, their planting uh, all the way up to harvest to know the health of their crop. And, um, Drones can play a big role in collecting information that gives farmers the ability to understand where that weed is on the field, how much is it, maybe what type of species it is, and then give them that information where they can take decisions to apply different kinds of, of, of chemicals or spraying, how much they should use, where they should not use it, and ultimately to gain some efficiencies that will ultimately increase the profitability of their farms. So this is taking that example I gave you of mapping weed infestation. So you have the drone or the, the copter or drone that was uh, described by our colleagues um, with lenses. It's flying over those fields and that information it generates creates data and layers that can be mapped. And as that information is translated into maps, farmers then have are able to categorize, okay, what are the types of, of weeds that are affecting my crop and what can I do, uh, what can I do about it? So these are, these are one example of things that, uh, that drone technology has brought into the, the farming space that is giving farmers um, new, new things to make better decisions. Now the question is, so how can drones play a role in uh, transforming agriculture in developing countries? I'm, I'm sure a lot of our participants and panelists are asking this question. So. Uh, in the developed farms or developed economies uh, across the world, of course, they have uh, access to capital and 
better training, better, let's say, finances and so on, that they can have this technology. They're working at larger scale. So what does it mean for, for developing countries? Um, we've seen it in the health space. Um, this one example that uh, has been quite uh, popular in the media of the public and private sector kind of coming together and they are delivering blood supplies in rural parts of Africa and Rwanda and in Ghana using drone technology. So it is there, it is available. There's a lot of, let's say, um, potential. Now, how do we make this accessible in, 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 into developing countries where, especially in environments where, where we're working, where I'm specifically working, we have farms that are on average less than one hectare. They're more small holders and they're still doing a lot um, by hand and, 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 and manual labor. Um, how do we get young people into, these, into this space? Um, these are all very challenging questions that I, I hope that we can try to address with our, our participants and things that we can work towards and, and take that technology that's out there being used by the advanced farms or, or big operations and how do we translate that and, and make uh, developing countries reap those gains and, 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 and transform. Um, so that's where I will leave off. Um, I know we are um, running uh, on time and to give participants a chance to also ask, uh, ask some questions. So I will turn over the floor to, to Alejandro to introduce our final speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sabros, uh, for giving us uh, these uh, very inspiring uh, uh, messages. Yeah, uh, particularly for uh, showing us uh, how uh, the technology has been uh, transforming the agricultural sector uh, with the years and, and with the different uh, use. And uh, what are the benefits of applying such uh, technologies with an example already uh, in, in, in the field and, and, and the benefits for farmers, for the stakeholders. Uh, I will continue now with uh, Farouk, our last panelist. Thank you so much. Uh Dear colleagues, a great opportunity for us to show what we're doing in Southern African subcontinent in terms of advancing sustainable industrialization. We are using satellite drones and technologies. I would also like to refer to what Alex was saying in the very beginning. So all this is about proper data collection and the data management. So I hope that this example will show how we're basically using this uh, data, how we're collecting this data not only for the better forestry management, uh, better environmental management, but also to turn it to financial management, economic management, business management, and also social management, how we're creating jobs thanks to this uh, technologies around uh, industrialization. So just to put you to the context, I would love to say a few words about the, the project, why we're talking about satellite technologies and drone technologies, how they're helping us, so basically we did it, we piloted within our project in Namibia, which is promoting sustainable bush processing value chains. And this project is funded by the government of Finland, also co-funded by the uh, Ministry of uh, Industry, Trade and SME Development of Namibia, and also uh, uh, co-funded by the local venture capital. So uh, just why all this project? You those who ha have been uh, at any time in Namibia uh, will never say this is Namibia because this is something, the picture uh, what was typical for this country some 50 years ago or for this region 50 years ago, you can see uh, free lands with the good uh, grass, with indigenous species, with cattle and wild animals browsing and basically uh, giving a very, very good room for crops and cattle uh, farming to uh, flourish and to contribute to this project and uh, uh, to this country's uh, wealth. But what we see now, what is the typical uh, landscape now is the what we call bush encroachment. So this a species which is basically traveling from West African subcontinent uh, from, the, from the northwest of, of the continent and which is basically invading uh, 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 the, the soil uh, and basically replacing the indigenous grass, the indigenous species. It has a huge uh, impact to the tourism sector because the animals are not visible. Farming is suffering from both crop uh, uh, farming and also cattle because cattle cannot browse within 
and the grass is not growing anymore. Moreover, these species are drinking a lot of underground water, 20 liters per day each bush. So the pace with which this is expanding is 1.5 million hectares per year. So there were a lot of uh, attempts to address this, but all was done at the laboratory, at the like experimental level. So the innovation, what we brought within this project together with our Finnish partners, was uh, uh, turning it to the industrial scale. So the idea was to use this uh, product to uh, create jobs, especially where the, uh, uh, the jobs are not so much available in this middle income country. So basically in the rural areas, it was not so popular just to cut this bush in the time of the climate change. So we decided to turn the, the bush to a, um, to uh, two, three types of higher value added products as animal feed, uh, charcoal for the pharmaceutical and chemical use and for domestic use, and also Arabic gum. So uh, the objective was to sustainably address the, this uh, uh, environmental problem while creating jobs uh, and export generating activities in the country. How we did it? We brought different technologies and I'll show how we did it. So basically we uh, brought the two containerized technologies to produce um, uh, animal feed. So the innovation was that the, the uh, equipment was like, I don't know how you says 10 times smaller than it's uh, 10 years uh, uh, all the like um, alternative and uh, the charcoal production. You know, charcoal production is not very environmental. So it, the innovation here is fully, it's zero emission production. It's instead of emissions, this uh, technology produces charcoal and some fertilizers and uh, tar for the uh, paint production. So these are the final products, what we're seeing at the end of the day. So just to, to show, what it brings to the country which is arid which is suffering from the drought so this is the animal picture at uh before feeding with uh, animal feed based on this invasive bush and this is the picture some uh, three months later with 50 kgs uh, uh, gained so i was taking this picture myself uh so the cooperation uh, was around to build up a um, a pilot plant uh, we we took the place in the north from the capital in the and uh, there was a good, uh, good cooperation. It is a good cooperation. Uh, this is not where my satellite picture will end. I'm just moving to the, uh, to the satellite and drone uh, technologies. So yeah, we, we basically build up the plant and it is, this is how it will look like. And this is the, the, the way it takes the shape these days, even during the COVID time. So we're having the industrial hub being erected. Now, what is beyond, yeah? So uh, this is the pilot plant, which for the first time we turned to, we tried to turn the um, experimental activities to the industrial scale. So behind this work, there was a huge work done uh, as the strategic action plan, which uh, involves market uh, uh, intelligence and technological feasibility of, of this pilot plant. And this suggested us that it could be multiplied. First of all, it will, it is, it is, will be profitable from 15 to 20% profitability on each product. And we can replicate this experience easily by the factor of 30 to 50 in Namibia itself and the factor of 100 in entire South and African continent. So we wanted to have a prediction model. I like, I, I will repeating all this uh, 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 jargons which were used by, by my colleagues, but in take, uh, applying to this particular case. So to see what is the potential, how to guide the harvesters to improve their profitability, how to make sure that uh, the, uh, there is a tool, a simple tool, based on the very big data processing is in the pocket of the harvesters where to go where it will be bigger uh, concentration of the invasive right bush not harming the indigenous bush it took us to the satellite level to uh, to to the um, to to the space uh, beyond stratosphere and toposphere and also to apply some drone technologies so 
the aim was to allow industrial scale identification of sustainable, targeted, responsible harvesting and processing of invasive species. That's why we appeal to the satellite drone based imagery recognition. So, uh, and also we went to artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, exercise, which I will be showing in the next few slides. Uh, so we started with this rather typical, what the specialist calls unclassified images or image unsupervised classification, where we only use the RGB, visually, be, visually separable uh, uh, data or like identifiable data based on RGB, uh, red, green, blue, uh, imagery and other visual uh, elements. So you see it on the right side of, of your picture, the data we were initially using. What was new in our project, we adapted it, we put upon the visual um, identification, the textural analysis uh, on top of, 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 of this visual interpretation. What does that bring actually? The uh, textual analysis helps to identify which items share the same structure. For instance, water, straps, soil, grass, trees, acacia themselves thereby creating different classes in the prediction model which we, uh, which we were aiming at. So we do not uh, um, have only the visual uh, but also textual characteristics which are in common between the different uh, um, classes. We're talking about uh, acacia, built, dense, vegetable, grass, pond, etc. So we did not stop here. So basically it was one of the big gains of the project. We were innovating by doing this uh, project and the, the innovation did not stop there. We tried to narrow down the analysis by turning to the individual uh, tree crown uh, coding. So uh, this basically, uh, you can see from the picture that this analysis, this narrow analysis, which was basically backed by the on the ground, let's say sampling, uh, gave us uh, the lati latitude and longitude plus the crown area of each specific bush crowns. In the next slide, uh, I will show you uh, how we did it. So this is the, the, the time we were using the R programming uh, to script this X, Y and crown area. You can see uh, these parameters in, in the table. So uh, what helped us to do so is basically on the ground analysis and also referring to some literature was, which was done in the region, uh, trying us to separate each single bush into uh, a different, let's say, volumes. Because uh, you know that for the animal feed, we're using only twigs, uh, um, vegetation and small branches, whilst the rest, which is above the soil is being used for the, um, for the charcoal, um, for the white charcoal and for the chemical pharmaceuticals uh, use charcoal. So uh, this, uh, uh, um, this analysis helped us to uh, describe better the volume of biomass which could be used from each single tree for respectively anim animal feed and charcoal production. Uh, so then at the end, all this helped us to commercialize or to see the commercial value of each of the segments of the soil around our hub and also to teach uh, our prediction model to apply the same uh, uh, analysis to the wider area in Namibia and also in the region. We are already having interest from the neighboring countries to replicate this experience. So you can see from this map that uh, it, it, it gives you not only the area, but also the, the number of the trees and the volume of uh, acacia trees there. And my final slide, this all complex thing we're just trying to put on the dashboard, but the dash dashboard you, uh, to be used on, not only by the Minister of Agriculture and Forestry, not only by the Minister of uh, Industry, Trade and SME Development, most importantly by the harvesters. So what you can see uh, uh, on, on the screen is the web-based dashboard. Uh, uh, when you zoom it in, it will be augmented reality-based manual for the harvesters, skilled, semi-skilled harvesters, which could be turned to the mobile device. So this program could help to zoom in a respective area and to be guided where there is a, a, a biggest uh, bush biomass needed. Why, why we're all doing this is just to 
uh, again, remind you, it's about the better farming and productivity, sustainable use of the land, renewable feather use, most importantly for you need a job creation and enhanced expertise on the ground. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Farouk, for uh, showing us a real uh, practical example on, on how to apply these technologies and, and the impact that it can have for uh, sustainable economic development in a developing country. Yeah, I will start quickly with the questions uh, uh, for Alex. Yeah. Uh, the regulatory frameworks can vary significantly across, uh, across countries. Uh, what has been your experience by promoting the use of drones and satellite images uh, across different regions of the world? Well, traveling to different countries with drones has become a challenge. So once first, due to safety reasons, bring them with a plane. So you have to carry, let's say, explosive batteries inside of a plane that's a problem then you need to get um, flying permissions inside of the countries so um, we stepped a little bit back from doing it ourselves so and our recommendation would be to work with local drone operators so because they have all the permissions in place and um, have the experience dealing with with, with the local authorities in regard to that and a second advice would be um, also always considering um, satellite imagery um, as, as an option to complement or substitute um, drone imagery if possible, because, if possible because that's certainly the more cost-efficient solution. Okay, uh, Maximilian, how can drones help uh, to optimize production and streamline uh, supply chains and logistics? Uh? in which uh, processes or areas uh, they can provide greater efficiency gains? Well, I think we stressed to the, uh, in our presentations and we're all quite uh, uh, pointing it the same, uh, in the same direction. It's all about data. It's all about uh, accurate data. It's about eliminating fault-prone processes where data will be collected where you're in doubt if you can use it. And let it be a drone or let it be a satellite picture um, this is where we have new technologies in place where we can, with respectively high cost, but uh, a good ratio of economy uh, and economic purposes, a high frequency of gaining data, a high frequency of having accurate data, uh, eliminating error and making better decisions, let it be for economic reasons or for sustainability reasons. Uh, technology is there and it's up to us whether we can use it or not. Okay, uh, Stavros, I have a very hard one for you. How can the use of drones or satellite imagery uh, help take uh, agriculture to new sustainability heights and move forward towards a bioeconomy, yeah? including uh, climate-friendly uh, agricultural practices uh, such as sustainable use of water and agricultural products? Okay, it's a very, very challenging question, Alejandro. Uh, uh, yes, I, I think one of the key words and I think the, the direction of precision agriculture is efficiencies and uh, drones given an, another level, a more precise level for farmers to be able to choose what is most appropriate for their farm. So when it comes to fertilizers, when it comes to um, pesticides, pest control, weed control, um, when it comes to water usage, um, one of the colleagues uses this example of NDVI as a way to uh, sensors to give a picture of the, the chlorophyll of the, of the plants so or the health of the plants. So all this, I believe, gives farmers a, a way to use those resources, those inputs in a more sustainable way, a more, let's say, efficient and cost-effective way. And I think those things in the long term will improve that let's say, impact that, it, that farming has on the environment because the challenge that we have to balance is that population is, 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 is growing and um, there's a lot more people to feed and uh, <coughs> land use and land control is, is, is a very challenging uh, um, topic. So I think that's where this type of technology will give farmers the, the ability to contribute more positively to a more sustainable farming uh, approach. Um, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. 
Uh, Farouk, what are the most important lessons uh, learned from the integration of, of these uh, technologies to achieve uh, sustainable bush uh, processing in Namibia? Um, well, if you mean uh, uh, the, the settle and the drone technologies, uh, basically, uh, well, basically, the project was for us a very big learning exercise. Uh, also, putting different technologies together, for, for instance, uh, producing, turning uh, the past into the value-added product. So never, no one thought about bringing two different technologies to uh, put a, an industrial uh, hub. Uh, talking about these, these particular uh, uh, technologies, I think we also, uh, as I was mentioning during my presentation, that uh, the, the, the implementation was a learning exercise for us. So basically, uh, we... I was dreaming first to use this technology before the starting of this project. And uh, uh, then we appealed to these technologies. We understood that it's, it's basically doable. Uh, it, is, it is there. We shall not be afraid of uh, basically using this technology, applying these technologies, even customizing these technologies innovating within these technologies, combining with other technologies, and uh, basically using it for the sake of, of uh, creating jobs and uh, value added in these countries, in, in the countries which are uh, very under diversified. So maybe just to directly ask, answer to your question, maybe the lesson learned is not to be afraid to experiment to use uh, these technologies. I mean, we shall not be afraid of from the words industry 4.0. It's, it's everything, everything is applicable. To simplify, to use, not to, to be afraid to combine the technologies, but of course with certain, I would say, high degree of safety and security, of course, by, by doing this. Okay, thanks. Uh... This brings me uh, to the next question. Uh, Alex, uh, what are the most commonly faced challenges that farmers and, and forest managers in developing countries may face uh, for acquiring satellite, drone, and field data? Yeah, and how they can be overcome? Um, basically, I don't see that there's a lack of technology. So technology is really in reach. Um, I think all over the place around the world. So if you have internet, um, you can have access to this te technology. So what is really missing, I would say, is the education and the domain knowledge. So to have people on the ground who can really ask the crucial questions. So first of all, you have to understand what NDVI means, what plant health means, how, how, that, this, how the e ecosystem work. And then you can, as I mentioned, formulate the right question. Um, what kind of information do I need to make better management decisions? So um, independent from the technology stack. So, and if you have this information, then you can reach out um, and let's say learn those technologies. So there's open source um, JS software we are using like QGIS. There are open source drones, which we are using, which have super performance, which have competitive costs. There are free data collection apps available and there's free satellite um, imagery available. So everything is basically in reach. So I think specifically in the developing context, we have to support the local farmers, the people on the ground to gain that knowledge, that domain knowledge so that they, let's say, um, can access um, or tap into this um, source of technology. Excellent, thanks uh, for this uh, nice answer. Uh, Maximilian, uh, you stress about uh, the importance of data. A significant amount of data is collected uh, while implementing drone uh, technologies in agriculture. Uh, uh, to who belong this uh, data and how uh, to prevent problems associated with privacy protection? Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, two answers to that. Uh, once, um, it's uh, good to have a very um, um, a good idea, good concept in terms of data usage uh, prior to the project is starting, which is uh, basically uh, technologies in place to prevent um, collecting 
personal data, which means our drones are equipped with, with uh, face recognition, not in order to identify the very person, but to blur this information uh, and to have people detect in order to get them out of the data, not to generate personal data that may later lead to, may lead to some kind of conflict. Uh, that, that's the one hand. So this is a technical a challenge to make sure that connecting so much data, you, you focus on the, the, the one kind of data you really want to, to uh, collect. And the other thing is for each and everyone who thinks uh, about uh, having a drone project set up, uh, to have this question clearly pointed out in, in the contracting and awarding phase to make sure that the data possession is very clearly structured in, in the contract or the purchase order uh, assigned from the very beginning so that you don't have to struggle over these issues afterwards because this is, this is a pain that you, you don't need to and each and every professional drone provider will have good answers to that and their technical solutions that prevent misuse uh, and that should be a focus for each and everyone who feels he wants or she wants to work with drones. Okay, very well. Uh, Stavros, I come again with, with uh, another one, uh, very uh, uh, interesting one, uh, particularly considering that uh, we have uh, today for, for the first time in these uh, webinars, we have no women present. Yeah? Uh, and this is uh, uh, something that uh, we need to uh, still work in more. Uh, women constitute the majority of the agricultural labor force in a small scale farming. How uh, can we better equip women and young female agripreneurs to reap the benefits of drones and precision agriculture? And how can this help uh, them uh, to build uh, future resilience? Very, very tough question, uh, Alejandro. And, and going back to um, what Alex uh, said about education, and I, I know it's very simple to say education is, is the solution, but what you see, at least in the countries that I've been working in, is um, people, young people don't want to be farmers, you know, whether they're boys or girls. And, and, uh, and, and those who may have r been raised in the rural areas, they, they are looking for ways to run away and, and move into the urban areas. And you start to see a, um, this decline. And, and, and then they go to the urban areas, I think, with a lot of high expectations that don't get met, right? And uh, so that education, I think, has to start very early. And uh, even, even at the elementary or primary level, with STEM education, with science and technology and, and you know, having young people, you know, work and engage in, 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 uh, in new, new things with their hands so they become excited about science, they get excited about technology and, and then subsequently moving gradually into, into the education space because there is a lot of technology today behind agriculture. And what those young people might see, they see their parents who have been working with their hands in a very labor intensive way. They don't see that as, a, as their option or their destiny. And, uh, and it doesn't need to be that way. And farming doesn't need to be that way. So this combination of mechanization and technology is, is one of the ways to bring people back to farming, get young people both men and women excited, uh, boys and girls excited about becoming agripreneurs or, or uh, agribusiness specialists. There's, there's many uh, fields. Uh, I had the opportunity to, to meet a young uh, Ghanaian uh, when I was in Ghana who had a pineapple farm, a very small pineapple farm. And he was, uh, he had a, you know, I wouldn't say a D DIY or uh, DIY uh, drone but he had a commercial small let's say you know off the shelf that you could find at a kind of any um, media mart or this kind of shops and he had an ndvi sensor on it and he was using it uh, to to assess and he said it saved him a, a lot of uh, money because he found out some some health problems that his his plants uh, found out so these people exist now how do you empower them how do you uh, use them as examples to other young people? So all these things have to, there's not one education solution, but there is many. And that needs to, I think this, the current generation of women who might be on the farm, those aren't the ones who are probably going to adopt that technology now, but we need to start with their children. We need to start with kids who are in the education system today or who have gone off to study 
who think that being in an urban environment is where they want to be and, and try to stimulate that creativity. And they will go back to the land and, and hopefully contribute positively to, to their society. So I think it needs a multi-dimension approach um, to, to take it to an, a level that it's exciting and it's not physical backbreaking work. And that technology is out there. Um, and we need to try to, as, a, as I think Alex said, that it's accessible. There's a lot of open source. There's a lot of uh, DIY uh, material. So it's there. It's just how do you empower and how do you build that knowledge ability to, to, to take it and, and do something with it. And I think that's the, that's the best way. And I think that's you know, where you know, organizations like, like Unido play, play this role to try to bring people together from private sector like we're doing. We're learning from, from our colleagues and bringing all these pieces together to, to come up with this uh, answer. And it's, it's not so easy, but I hope that that clarifies. Thank you, Alejandro. Thank you very much, Stavros, uh, for, for uh, also this uh, very inspiring answer yeah? and, and, and for uh, comprising all, all these elements uh, which are um, uh, very important if we want to bring uh, women and, and youth uh, for this uh, uh, value chains again. Uh, Farouk, uh, we have uh, one uh, question for you, which is uh, very similar to those that uh, we have been receiving uh, from the chat uh, some, some minutes ago. Uh, in which other areas uh, could drones and satellite uh, field data uh, be used uh, to advance industrial and sustainable, uh, uh, inclusive and sustainable industrial development in, in Southwest Africa or in other developing countries? Um, thank you so much for addressing this question. It's a really big question. Basically, um, as we speak, the areas of use of the drones is being increased. I mean, uh, yeah, apart from like using it as, as a prediction model, as I showed in our experience, we can see that how the drones are being used like in the smart uh, warehouse management, like indoor management, even uh, Drones are now uh, flying with inside of the uh, pipelines to monitor. Uh, the drones could be used for the better surveillance of the mining activities, like Dan mentioned, stones, ores. Uh, you know, in transportation, even is being used now for some extended areas. Uh, you know, th there are some drones which are already spraying fertilizers, uh, I mean, talks, go, returning back to the agricultural activities. So, you know, it just, just to have maybe, uh, as I said, to, to generalize in which areas uh, uh, the, the drones could be used, whenever uh, humankind could find a way how to use the, uh, the remote sensoring, uh, where to use the larger picture, let's say, uh, way, way to use the prediction models and uh, where to save time, resources, and uh, uh, to, to ensure the uh, fast return of investment, wherever it will be possible, I think the humankind will go and businesses, agriculture will go and use these uh, technologies. And the beauty of these technologies is that the new areas are being pop popping up as we speak. Thank you very much, uh, Farouk. And, and, and I want to thank uh, all of the panelists at this stage and, and to all of those that have been attending to this session. Uh, I would like to remind uh, that we have recorded this session and that we will make uh, the presentation available afterwards uh, for your further reference. Uh, all the questions uh, that our participants have been posing in, in the questions and answers section uh, will be uh, replied uh, later and um, will be, I mean, these answers will be available for you as well. Uh, I would like uh, to take the opportunity to invite also all of you uh, for the next uh, webinar session next week. Uh, uh, that will be, uh, we will be talking about uh, fisheries, I mean, on, on, on the application of big data and other uh, technologies in fisheries. I think will be also relevant. And with this, I think uh, we are ready to close the session. Uh, I would like to thank again all the panelists 
uh, for sharing all this uh, knowledge and, and, and uh, the uh, fascinating uh, world of uh, satellite and drones imagery with us and, and the application particularly for developing countries, uh, for helping them uh, in the uh, path uh, to the SDGs and, uh, and the 2030 agenda. Thank you very much. Uh, and, and I wish you uh, all the best.